Hi everyone, my name's Alana Fitzgerald. Um, I'm a graduate OER um, PhD student. I'm also um, working with the OER Research Hub in the UK. Like Pat, I've been involved in a couple of UK OER projects related to linguistic tools for OER um, and open source tools as well. Okay, so. Uh, I'm going to tell you today about the FLAX language project based at the University of Waikato in New Zealand today. And these are the main people behind the FLAX project, Ian Witten and Xiao Chun Wu. Um, the site is, is actually um, based in New Zealand and it's just gone into um, automatic update mode as of this morning because I presented yesterday and, and they knew I was presenting yesterday on the FLAX project, so I guess they thought, oh, it's all okay, Alana doesn't need it anymore. So today I'm not going to give you any live demos, unfortunately, but I will be showing you lots of um, screenshots. I've even got some training videos on YouTube as well. Okay, so I mean, FLAX, the, the screenshots that I'll show you today are for English language collections. However, it is a multilingual software where you can build collections in any modern language. And that's what we'd really like people to do because it's an open source software and we would like there to be more crowdsourcing of collections in other languages as well. So we'll show you what it can do in English, but just bear in mind that you can do that in other languages as well. Okay, um, yesterday's talk was really more on the research side of my collaboration with FLAX. Um, I have a language teaching background um, in particular, I'm interested in academic um, English, which is um, a huge requirement for a lot of people that would want to access a lot of open MOOCs, um, courses online that are in English. But once again, we could make collections in other languages as well. Okay, but if you want to check that out, that's available on SlideShare. Um, so the menu du jour. Um, for Flex today, as I'm going to just show you a little bit more about how Flex looks. Um, we'll be focusing on interface design and the different types of um, linguistic features that Flex is <coughs> generating as a tool. And, and then a discussion about collections building because it's great that the Flex team um, can build collections, but we really want um, the collections to be built by by people who are interested in developing language collections. And we don't mean researchers, we just mean everyday people. We mean you know, language learners, language teachers, um, instructional designers, maybe a subject academic at a university who wants to build in these linguistic features on top of their course content. Okay. So um, Flex is open source. And and we do tend to put things out on the Flex website before they're ready because we want to get people to feedback on them, um, myself included, other teachers who might be using the tools just to generate feedback so we can reiterate and improve the tools. So it's very much fitting in with that open source approach. Um, I've put the URL here, but of course the Flex site is um, undergoing updates at the moment all the way over in New Zealand, it's the other um, time zone as well, so it's the middle of the night, so I'm sorry that that's not live for you to play around with. Um, I usually tell people to search for Flex language, because if you just put Flex into Google, obviously you're going to come up with the plant, or Flex seed oil, or something like that, so that's a quick way to search for it when it's actually um, available. So here's a, um, a Flex interface for a, um, a large collection called collocations, learning collocations. Collocations are essentially just words that form together. Um, so we've got a search, I'm not sure if you can see it, it's on the word virology, and the um, collection is just showing you how that word virology um, functions within a large database, within a large corpus of language. And in fact, in this collection, we have three corpora behind the interface. One is a Wikimedia corpus of 200 million articles in English that have all been indexed. Um, and then we've got the British National Corpus, which is 100 million words of British um, 
writing mainly, it's 90% 90, 90 writing, so different domains of writing, magazines, novels, newspapers and so on, and it's also 10% spoken English as well, um, of everyday conversations, presentations in universities, meetings, that type of thing. And then we've got another corpus that interfaces this collection, which is called the British Academic Written English Corpus, or also known as The Boar, which is a great title. And that's a student um, corpus of student writing um, from three universities. Um, so anyway, you can see it um, sorts it into part of speech, so noun plus of plus virology. Um, you've got here, um, you can click into deeper levels. It gives you the examples of that collocation, that language and context. You can save them to what's known as the cherry basket. So if you've got a learner going through the system, they can save useful phrases. It really teaches you how language is used in authentic situations. We've got related words. So whenever somebody is reading or discussing the topic of virology, quite often these other words will come up in relation. So what the machine is doing is it's looking across the whole corpus or the whole database and seeing, you know, when people are writing or talking about virology, they're also using these words virus, retrovirus, cancer, flu, influenza, quite often. So this is collocations at a wider level, so words that are co-occurring, um, but not necessarily next to virology, the word, but co-occurring across documents. So that's quite nice. And then you've got definitions taken from Wiktionary and related topics in Wikipedia. So instead of students sort of coming across a word that they don't know, um, it just sort of brings in other resources into the same interface. So instead of going to Wikipedia, it will just bring the Wikipedia to you in the linguistic software. OK, this is the traditional keyword and context um, concordance interface from the field of lingu uh, corpus linguistics. And this is what we had before we had FLAX. This was designed primarily by corpus linguistics researchers um, for research purposes, and they do, um, so this keyword and context will show you how the word virology is appearing in, in text. And the idea from those researchers was, well, language learners can use this too. They can just look at it and they can figure out what the word patterns are. But I would argue that that's quite a complex task for a language learner to do. You would have to have quite a, um, a good knowledge of language um, to see how that language is actually working around the word virology. So we're trying to get away from that interface to something that's more helpful. And of course, there's a lot of data behind the interface, so it's quite a difficult thing to decide how to organize the language. Um, but we're constantly revisiting our interface design and updating to try and make it more usable. OK, so here are some of the, the features. Um, sorry. Some of the features, such as collocations and word lists. There are training videos. I'll probably not have time to go into those today, but you can go away and have a look at how to use the system and see if you might want to build a collection yourself. Um, I would just say another thing about collocations. Um, in a lot of language learning textbooks, um, dictionaries included, it's very difficult for textbook makers and dictionary makers to provide lots of examples of collocations for domain-specific areas because they have to decide how many examples of language in use am I going to put with this dictionary definition or in this um, language textbook for teachers and learners to use in the classroom. So there's only so much that they can fit into their paper book, textbook, or onto a CD-ROM. So they make selections. So if you want to build your own collection, and I'm going to show you very domain-specific uh, collections, um, that will give your learners um, a greater insight into how language is being used within that domain. Because we don't have, well, you can get a law dictionary, or you can get um, particular science dictionaries. However, um, that hasn't really crossed over into the language textbook world. So they tend to focus on generic examples of language rather than specific. Okay, so 
Uh, this is a training video for the British Academic Written English Corpus. This is the Learner Corpus. This is a very interesting corpus because there, it's not only automatically um, analysed with the FLAX tool, it has had some human analysis um, through the corpus building um, stage. So the developers of this corpus, Nessie and Gardner, they wanted to show that across university student writing, that there are many genres of writing at the academic level, not just the essay. So they came up with um, 13 different genres of student writing. And I think this is particularly um, key. So you can browse by genre. So you've got essays, you've got report writing, um, you've got proposal writing. Uh, because a lot of um, language preparation programs for a university do tend to focus on academic writing as the essay. But that's not much help if you're going on to do physics or um, something else, um, you know, across, across the different subject areas. I'm going to show you some screenshots from a virology collection, for example, um, which there isn't really an essay writing requirement. There would be more of an explanation writing requirement. So, describing things in depth from your field or showing that you understand key terms and concepts from your field. Okay, so you can sort by genre or by discipline. So there are lots of different disciplines within this collection as well. Um, we've got word lists. Okay, so this is taken from the Arts and Humanities subcorpus of this Bohr corpus. And you'll see that a theory is coming up tops there. And we have part of speech tagging or post tagging. So that's pretty simple for us to do, actually. And there's usually about a 90, 97% rate of accuracy. So it's just going to sort things into noun phrases there or adjective phrases. This is so much easier than a student you know, going through a lot of texts and highlighting, or even a, a language teacher trying to pick out what the, the language patterns are to present back to their students. So it's just going to do it for you automatically. Um, we have this cherry basket function, which I mentioned before, where you can add um, part of speech or collocation phrases. So then you can go back and see what you were looking at so it's saved for you. And that's an example of the cherry basket showing the different items that the user has searched for. OK, um, the great thing about the FLAX project is that we're very keen to link in different data sets. Because if you're building a very niche collection, say you're building a collection on law. So you're bringing in law articles, law lectures, uh, law case um, reports. Um, so that's going to be very specific to that domain of law. But it's really nice to link those data sets to larger data sets which Flex will do for you. So it's going to link to this Wikipedia um, collection to give you more conceptual knowledge. But it's also going to link to the web samples, which is derived from um, a large Google linguistic data set that we pulled um, from one of their web dumps. And we just formatted that. Um, so that's a way of showing how that word is used in your specific corpus. But then when you take it wider, you can see how the, the language is also used across larger um, data sets to show you really um, what is happening with this language item that you're interested in. Okay, then we've got this wikify function. It's great, we've made it into a verb, wikify. Um, so connect to Wikipedia. Um, so you can see um, the word I have clicked on is disp. No, yeah, this, no, yeah, I'm not quite sure how to say that. Um, so that's giving you an example of a very specific, domain specific language. And then you just click on the Wikify because it's going to go through and sort out, you know, what are concepts within your text that are actually already written about on Wikipedia. And it's going to bring that up into, as an interface to give you a short definition plus any related topics. So it enables you to go wider across the concept area that you're looking at. Uh, we do have word lists. We've got other words here. We really should enable, we should title that as keywords or not keywords, but specific words to that domain. And you can see that text was um, a text taken from a student's, a medical student's 
um, description of a patient coming into an accident and emergency um, center of a, of a hospital. And you can see words like symptoms, referral, that word again that I can't say, wheezing, gasping, they're all, they're all popping up um, as very specific. We say other words because they don't belong to a particular word list. So we have a general word list for languages, which is your sort of basic words. We have academic word lists, which are general academic words across different domains. But here we would call this an off-list word um, because it shows specific words within that um, document related to that topic. So we, but to make it more user-friendly, I think we need to change that to specific words. Um, because if you're not a linguist, you wouldn't know what that means necessarily. Um, so, yeah, I did this project uh, reusing Oxford um, podcasts, lectures. Here's some lectures on um, the financial crisis. And so this, this focus with this project was really like, how can we show people to take all this OER and, and put it into FLAX and um, build collections for language support out of that? Because a lot of these lectures are very, you know, obviously they're academic. It's a high level of language expectation um, to, to place on learners. So if we can break that down and give some support, that would be useful. So that's a training video about how to build your own collections. Um, different interactivity. We have um, also these automated act activity types in FLAX. You know, scrambled sentences, paragraphs, close exercises with missing words. We've also got some more um, dynamic, dynamic ones as well, which I'll show you some screenshots of. So we've got, I think you can see number eight, collocations dominoes. So um, that shows you a dominoes game where you have to sort of create your own exercise. Um, so we're trying to make things as interactive as possible. And you'll see those in the training videos. Um, as well. So that's an interface for you as a developer. Um, so if you want to create a, um, an activity in your collection, um, it's just showing you your choices. So it's going to show you keywords popping out of that lecture and then you can um, make an activity um, from the back end. Okay, so that was a, a close exercise. Um, so that previous slide was showing you the words, the key content words, and then you just sort of selected which ones you wanted to come up in the activity, and then here it is, and then people just basically drag and drop. Um, scrambled sentences can be quite nice for learners to get a better understanding of the higher level of language, the discourse level, you know, how paragraphs fit together, how sentences fit together. It's a very typical thing that you would do in a writing class is teach those types of skills, like what is the connection um, between sentences, between paragraphs. Drag and drop, lots of those. Okay, so different interfaces for creating collections. This one is actually dynamic, so you choose um, the collocations once again. And basically there's this little box at the bottom where you have to sort of type in what the, what the keyword is. Um, and then it will, will stop. It's very hard to do it actually without a, a demo, but basically it will populate um, the collocations. Um, but they've been sort of coming down the screen. It's a little bit like Pac-Man, if you can remember that. The collocations are floating down the screen and you've got to type what the word is that goes with that key collocate. And, and then once you've done it, it populates the whole screen. And then you can, they're all, hyperlinked, you can go deeper into um, those different collocations and see how that language is being used in context. So we're really trying to develop the interactive. Um, this is Vincent Racaniello, he's a professor at Columbia and he's um, put all of his um, teaching resources out there as um, CC BY. Uh, so he's got a lot of lectures on YouTube, which are, have also been extremely popular on iTunes U. Now he's released this as a course, two courses on, vi on virology in Coursera. And um, this is just a quotation from Douglas Biber, also um, based in the USA, about natural science language being very specific. 
It's not the type of language which you have everyday synonyms for. And so for me, you know, dextranoid, electrophoresis, honestly, that to me is a foreign language. So I can see here the benefit of having domain-specific language collections to support online learning, to support MOOCs, to even support, you know, classroom-based um, academic studies. Um, because this is not going to be something that you're going to pick up from a regular language textbook, um, per se. And, th and there will be people you know, coming across these resources, even as native speakers of English, who would struggle with what the concepts are, what the meanings of the terms are. Um, sorry, just to go back to um, Vincent. So he's very prolific as a digital scholar. He's got this um, TWIV. This Week in Virology, it's a weekly podcast show that he does with experts about virology. So he's somebody who's very, very much in the public arena talking about, you know, the latest um, flu virus that's, that's becoming a pandemic. And, um, and he does have these um, discussions with people at New York Times. You know, he writes back to them and says, look, you've got this information wrong. You know, you're creating fear unnecessarily. And you have this big exchange. Um, with journalists about you know, getting the information right. And I think that's a great example of um, developing criticality um, with his students because he's talking about this in his lectures. Um, and he's also got a virology blog. Uh, so he's a very prolific man, great digital scholar, great um, uh, example of somebody who is an open educational practitioner as well. Um, Okay, so for the virology collection of Flax, what I did is I just took all of the podcast transcripts. That all of his lectures are on YouTube. Flax will just stream um, and show the, uh, the YouTube videos. I mean, we are quite reliant on transcripts, though, because as you know, the automatic transcription tools that we have available are not um, accurate. They have a low accuracy rate, depending on the speaker. Like, Actually, he, he's actually a very clear speaker. He does good quality recordings. And of course, he's North American. So automatic transcription tools will pick up quite a high percent, or not high, but you know, within the 30, 40% range. Whereas a lot of um, lectures that are out there on iTunes, U, et cetera, um, YouTube, they, they will only come back with a 10 or 5% accuracy rate. So depending on quality, depending on accent, so we are very dependent on transcripts, but hey, most um, large MOOCs now do provide transcripts. So I think this is a good opportunity to build these types of collections. Um, the guy is a, is a very prolific blogger, so I'm formatting about 500 of his blog posts. They're all hyperlinked to different areas across the web. Uh, we've got open access research articles. So basically what's in the MOOC is what we're trying to put into the collection because we think it will be of use. It's going to be motivating um, because it's what they have to look at anyway. And, and if you build these interactions um, through Flax that try to mimic the quizzes, the weekly quizzes in the MOOC or the exam, I mean, we're hoping that that's going to bring students to the use of these collections because it's something that actually reflects what they need to do on the MOOC. I hope that's um, clear enough. So that's an example of the virology collection, which is very much in beta at the moment. We, we still need to add to that. So you've got the YouTube video, the lecture transcript, and that's just showing you the Wikify function again. Um, this is looking at the word list. I just looked at it's, um, organized alphabetically. So words like, yeah, variolation, what does that mean? Honestly, um, unless you're a virologist, who would know? Um, and and here it's linking to um, Wiktionary that does show you that variolation is part of inoculation. Um, so really getting drilling down to that deeper level of domain-specific language. Um, so these are the collocations. So we're, using, we're um, asking Flex to go through and pull out these types of collocation patterns in particular because we believe that they are the most salient for topic-specific text. Um, so tobacco mosaic virus was the first virus that um, virologists started um, working with to, 
to understand that there was actually this other whole other domain of um, things in science which which they didn't, they didn't know were viruses. So, I mean, if you follow his course, that's quite a, a key one that people talk about. Lexical bundles, this idea of um, more extended phrases. So this is Douglas Biber's work again. Um, and these are the types of things that lecturers would say. So, you know, for example, it turns out that something is an example of that. You can see that. So this is very typical lecture language. But it's, you also have lexical bundles in writing as well, so set phrases. Um, OK, and then finally, flex. I mean, we're trying to be flexible. So uh, we can build collections with open content, put them on the web, on the Flex website, which is what I'm doing because I'm an OER practitioner. Um, but you can also download the software. It's all OSS. Put it onto your PC. There's also a, a Moodle plugin that was developed. Um, we'd love for any platform, online or MOOC or whatever, to take the software and embed it into their platform so that it's actually part of the package. Um, and of course, there's loads of um, great studies going on now with translation to support online learning. Um, and that's great to get it in, translated into the language of the user. But we feel that there's a gap, because if you're required to communicate in the MOOC, and let's say it's in English or in German, how are you going to communicate in the forums, or how are you going to do any writing when you don't have the tools to show you how to use that language of that course so that you can communicate productively through writing and speaking? Um, forum, I'm going to put it in the speaking category. Um, uh, because translation will give you the receptive language skills of listening and reading content, but it won't give you any help with being productive in that course language. And if that course language is English or German or Spanish, you're going to need some extra help. And especially with MOOCs, there isn't the money, is there? There isn't the support to give specific um, human language support. Um, but if we can build in some of these automated tools, it does, it does go some way to helping people to understand and to actually participate. So that's all I have for you today, folks. Um, thanks for listening. Thanks for coming to. So, questions? Yes, Pat. If I have the Moodle plugin, yeah. does that link back to your site? Or is that like a standalone? It's a, at the moment, it's a standalone. I, I guess we could link it back to the site as a demonstration, as a model, because we, we're quite interested on the Flex website, because we've got this whole area, you know, collections built by other users, because we're really trying to get people to populate the site to show how the, the software is flexible and can be used to build all sorts of collections, you know, whether those collections are for children learning a language or for something very specific like virology. So, I mean, that would be nice. I don't see there being a problem. Um, but I guess we were going along the lines of trying to think, well, what are universities or what are colleges doing? They're kind of using things like Moodle, and because Moodle is open source, we can easily build this plugin. But they tend to be these VLEs, these um, uh, virtual learning environment. What, what do you call that in the States again? LMS. LMS, that, that is closed, right? So, so that's why we thought, oh, we'll make, the, we'll make the software available so people can build these closed collections behind the scenes where they don't really have to worry about copyright. Well, they do, they should. But um, as you know, in, in reality, that doesn't tend to happen. And there are people that would want to build a language corpus. Say you're doing a PhD in something really obscure like Egyptology, and there aren't many open access articles out there, but you can just take any reading, any electronic text, and put it into this software and have your own little corpus going on your computer. So there's definitely, with us, with the Flex project, we're interested in open, but we're interested in making it flexible and realistic for the, for the uses that people want to um, apply to the software. So thanks, Pat, yeah. Oh, yes. Uh, do you see any potential for cheap translation technology coming? 
Sorry. So um, do you see any potential for machine translation technology to come in when it comes to bridging the uh, back mountain, the gap? So you mentioned the example of uh, having an uh, open course or whatever kind of electronic course in a different language, so you understand the language. Do you think that uh, machine translation technology in addition would also help? So this basically just yeah. approach teaches you to Yeah, use yeah. Um, yes, I think, I think they're doing different things, aren't they? Yeah. Um, but I think they're both really useful. I mean, we don't, this is the thing with translation, we're really good with text-to-text -text translation now. We're not so good with speech-to-text. Um, so, and this is looking at more sort of linguistic analyses for the language. I really need to emphasize that this tool is for language learning and teaching. It's not just for receiving language through translation, but I think we need to have the two together because these are the tools that are available, so why wouldn't you use them as, as a whole toolkit? Um, we're not at that point where they're sort of interfacing and all working together. Um, it's a great thing that Google um, have got YouTube in, in some ways because they've got the money to invest in um, text-to-speech transcription technologies, more so than your average um, linguistics research department at any university. So, you know, um, if the big companies are investing in this, we'll probably see more progress. But at the moment, yes, we've got this going on with translation, we've got this going on with language support. Why not try and find a way to bring them together? That would be good. Thank you. Yeah. So following up on that, is there, uh, it seems like it would be really useful to have cross-language corporate. Um, yeah. Something where we had, you know, an English language and a German language virology yeah. And, uh, you know, machine translation could potentially help you figure out the collocations in English that correspond yeah. to the ones in German. That's and right. It's easier for an English, English speaker to learn to communicate in German. Uh, yeah, languages. that would be great. I mean, that's getting into the area of parallel corporate. <coughs> um, yeah, we just need more people to think about creating those interfaces between these technologies and these approaches, um, definitely. There's a definite need for that, just to underscore what you're saying. So thank you so much for your time, everyone.